right, how's everybody doing? Welcome on board. We got Ricardo Felipe from Portugal, man. Welcome. Jim S. from Tennessee. We got my man from, again, Ricardo Felipe from Portugal, man. Thank you for joining me. New Jersey in the house. East Coast, Wisconsin with Nancy in the house. Mario. Come on, man. Where are you from, Mario? Give it up. Kush Patel. All right, from California. Hate cold, cold. Hate cold everything. <laughs> I bet, man. Oh, man. Uh, we got Mike Janice. Janice is always in the house, man. Thank you for always joining us, man. That's pretty cool. Uh, I really do love cold calling. You're a sick man. And Jim S., you're a sick man. <laughs> you know, uh, Jim S., SV. And there's my man, Victor Tan. Thank you for joining me, Victor Tan. Mia Knox back in the house. Love it. No fear, brother. That's, that's really it, right? It's no fear. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, this uh, Akbar... Akbar Palampurwala, you felt the need to write your name twice. I dig that, man. That's cool. Man, there comes Ebox Tenders. You're back from Trinidad, the Caribbean, man. Uh, Evelyn Bias, Punta Cana. Love Punta Cana. Great memories in Punta Cana. Uh, Central America, Guatemala. There you go. Let me see who else. I hate the word no. Who does? Right? Keith from Chicagoland, making 50 plus cold calls a day. I don't know. I talked to a friend of mine today. He's making about a hundred, man. Up your game, Chief Keith. But way to go, man. Fifty is great, man. Actually, that's that's pretty damn good. But anyway, so I wanted to, you know, I've been doing these um, these live streams, man. So and by the way, give me your feedback on what you think of these live streams. You know, if you like them, uh, what you want me to talk about on the next episode. But what's interesting is that I'm, I'm getting a lot of, you know, I, I've noticed that on some of the feeds as you're chatting through right now, I get a lot of, um, uh, you know, questions about cold calling. And so I thought I'd do something just on cold calling. Uh, uh, Jim S. says, if you don't call out of fear, then s them say no, then you are saying no for them. And never say no for them. Ain't that the rule, right? That's the rule. Never say no for your customer. Let them say no. And that's a very valuable list. We should hit on that later on. And uh, big up to Keith, man, for making the 50 calls a day, man. Way to go. So cold call reluctance. I, I once heard somebody said that cold call reluctance you're gonna love this one. Is a mental disorder where sales that prevents salespeople from picking up the phone. It's a mental disorder that prevents salespeople from picking up the actual phone. So I gotta believe uh, it's true. Cold calling or LinkedIn for my LBO structure funding. Love it, man. Whether it's cold emails or you know cold email could help. Hey, it's never one or the other, right, Ricardo? It's always a little bit of both. So I always think you know you know you always hear these guys. I remember years ago, was, uh, a couple of people wrote books on cold calling is dead. And I'm like, ah, no, it ain't, you know, uh, cause like it's never dead. Cold calling is never dead. Just like emailing is never, texting is never dead. These things will never die. It's omni-channel approach to how best to reach your customers. So I think you guys all get that. But anyway, so I thought today, uh, let me see, I got some more coming in here. My salespeople are encouraged to grow a phone out of the ear. That sounds weird, but we'll go with that, Jim. I know what you mean though. I'm an, I'm inbound sales, not outbound. Hey, Nancy, you still have to have the conversations, right? You still have to have the conversations with the client. Because remember, even if it's inbound, you still got to close them on the deal or a meeting or a demo, whatever it may be. So, you know, you're still selling. But it is nice when they're calling you because you now know it's a warm call. So I thought I'd just take time tonight just to kind of go through, you know, what's the psychology? I should have really titled this The Psychology of Cold Calling Fear. I mean, I think that's the real title. But I love, you know, this is a famous phrase, right? Cold call reluctance. And so, uh, let me see, uh, as Dan Pena always talks about, it's a numbers game eventually, someone says yes. It is, I mean, and, and again, there's, there's very arguments uh, for whether it's a numbers game or not. I personally think it's a, it's a numbers game if you apply it intelligent and you know who you're calling. I agree with that, so yeah, I'll qualify that. But cold call reluctance, tonight's uh, live stream should be really the psychology of why people don't call. And so, I want to share this with you because for one of two reasons. One, if you're training somebody or you're managing somebody and they're, they're having a hard time making the calls, maybe as I go through 10 reasons why people don't do it, just by identifying what it may be, you may be able to help that person. And if you're a person who is suffering from this mental disorder called cold call reluctance, we know that in order to solve a mental problem, we first begin by labeling it. And if you label it, then we can address it. Does that make sense? Hit me with a one if that makes sense. So 
this mental disorder we call cold call reluctance. Uh, again, I'm gonna go through it. And by the way, before I forget, uh, people keep asking me, the little bell right there, I keep putting it right there. The little bell right there. That's the bell you have to hit when you subscribe to my channel that lets you know when I'm about to go online, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. Uh, Chief Keith says, how important is it to change up the verbiage and or inflection in your pitch on the cold call? The answer is really important. And I, I, you hit on something, uh, uh, Chief Keith, and that is that how you use your voice. And I, I learned this years ago, you know, that your voice is really a sales instrument. How you use your voice, whether it's you're talking fast, talking slow, talking loud, or pausing and dropping and emphasizing a point. Your voice is a tool. So yes, inflection, what you say, how you say it, when you say it, is always important. So anyway, uh, let me get into this. So 10 reasons why people might resist cold calling. And if you find yourself in any of these 10, if you're, you know, again, just kind of jot them down. Remember, the ability to solve a problem begins with first labeling what the problem is. So I've listed, it's almost like one of those night shows. I've listed the top 10 reasons people hate cold calling or why they have cold call reluctance. Reason numero uno is that, and I think I spelled interrupt right, you know how you've been taught as a child, or were you taught as a child, I, sh I shouldn't assume anything, were you taught as a child, never interrupt adults when they're talking. And then the second thing you were taught is never talk to strangers. And that was me and my family, very Puerto Rican Spanish family, right? Never interrupt, right? And never talk to strangers, never interrupt, never talk to strangers. And so that's gotta be sitting back here somewhere. You know, somewhere back here, it's got to be sitting like, I don't want to interrupt them. It's so rude. And I was taught never interrupt strangers, right? And so that, that means one of the reasons we want to not call. But so now that we've labeled that, let's call that the interrupt stranger effect. Keep in mind that if you really care about your customers and you have a product or service that you know will help their business, wouldn't you want to interrupt them? It says, hey, if you saw a friend about to make a bad decision, a good friend of yours about to make a bad decision, a bad bet, so to speak, a bad move, wouldn't you say, look, I mean, I think you need to think about this before you, you know, pull the trigger on that. You would interrupt them. So think about it this way, that if you understand that you're there to help clients, which that should be your mindset. You're there to help clients. And because you're there to help clients with your product or service, then it's okay to interrupt them, especially if you have some value. So that would be step number one. Don't be afraid to interrupt strangers, especially when you have value. And I'll dig deeper into that one. So, and like I said, keep track of these and let me know if any of these resonate with you or what you suffered or what you experienced in the past. Number two, this is an obvious one, right? Uh, I threw this one in there. This is a layup one, fear of rejection. Nobody likes to know. We already had that, right? And so, uh, you know, uh, Ramirez says, <laughs> this is funny, man. Uh, Ramirez Levia. Uh, he says, uh, I can't tell you're Puerto Rican because, so bro, you're Puerto Rican. Yes, I am 100% Puerto Rican. Uh, I can't tell from your accent. That's because I was born in Chicago. My family's uh, Barranquitas y Ay Bonito. Baba, soy de aquí. So you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, uh, so the problem is getting past the client's reception. It's, it's complicated because they are trained to reject everything. We'll get into that. Hold up, Ricardo. We'll get into that, Ricardo. Just hold that. I want that. Hold on, right? So, uh, so number two is fear of rejection. And the fear of rejection is that it's just that simple. It's like, but you got to understand, I learned this early on. And first of all, I labeled it, right? Fear of rejection. And then on top of that, what I also learned is that when they reject you, when they say reject you, I should say they say no to your offer. They're saying no to your offer. They're not saying no to you. For some reason, you're taking it personally. Do you, are you so arrogant to think that if a customer says no to you, that they're still thinking about you after they hung up the phone call? No, they're not thinking about you. They've moved on. So why don't you move on? Because it's not personal. And sometimes it has nothing to do with you or your offer. It's just the timing. So again, keep that in mind that the fear of rejection is it, it, it should pass right through you. That's what selling is. Uh, whoever was mentioned, they did 50 calls, right? Right off the bat, every day they're hitting 50 calls. I mean, that's a person who understands. No fear, just go for it. I think Jim talked about it already. No fear, just call. What's the worst they're gonna do? Say no or hang up. Ah, oh, nobody's ever died from somebody saying no or hanging up on you. Keep that in mind. Number three, okay? Ah, uh, this is an interesting one. Sometimes it's, you know, and this is a real one. This I think is a real one. And now we're getting into some meat here. By the way, they get more intense as I go through these, okay? So then 
Sometimes you simply don't know who to talk to, who to call. This is why it's important to identify your ideal client profile so you know who to talk to. And even if you know who to talk to, sometimes you don't know what to say. Now this is a problem because one of the things you don't want to do is practice on your clients. I, I got to repeat that because I want you to hear what I just said. Never practice on your clients. When you're on the phone with your clients, it should flow out of you. Just like my friend from Portugal said, Ricardo, I think, it said, your tone, your voice, your inflection, everything should come out of you so naturally that even when the customer asks you a tough question, you have the answer. How do you get there? First of all, let's talk about, let's make sure we got the who to talk to. The who to talk to is you've got to identify who the key players are. And then sometimes you're calling into an organization, maybe you don't know. But let's be honest, if you really did some research, you know who would buy your product. Who is more likely to want to talk, who you want to talk to within a company. So maybe if we don't know who to talk to, we just haven't done enough research. Having done enough research, what do we say to that person? Now when we're talking to that person, one of the things we should do, one of the things we should have already programmed in our brain, and I'm going to use the word programmed, because we, again, we never practice on our clients. I'm going to suggest that you do some role playing. Do you know what I mean by role playing? By the way, if you like role playing, well, well not if you like it, because I personally don't like it, but if you know what role playing is and you use role playing, hit me with the word role playing. Just hit me with that phrase, role playing, because role playing is powerful. Find somebody that, that you trust, that you feel comfortable with, that you can have an imaginary conversation with, almost like a phone call, and then have that person push back a little bit, you know, give you a little resistance. Now, may I suggest something? To do role playing, what I want you to do is, again, it feels awkward, it feels silly, but I'm telling you, that's how you practice. What I want you to do is when you do role playing, sit back to back. Don't sit face to face, sit back to back, like this, like that, and the other person's back to back. And then you're the caller and the other person's a potential client. The reason I want you to do it that way is because I want you to simulate what a phone call is. See, when you're making a phone call, you're not seeing the person's visual body language or anything. So therefore, sitting back to back allows it to be more natural. So when you get to the point where you feel comfortable with the back and forth script, right? And again, find a good partner that's going to give you great feedback. And then when you're talking to clients, it becomes very natural. So that's the part about being natural. What to say is, I'm going to suggest, like I said, I always point to that. In there, I got, uh, I got a program called The Perfect Voicemail. And that is what to say when you're going to leave multiple voicemails. Because what I want you to do is to have your scripts already written out. What you're going to say the first time, in case you get the voicemail. What you're going to say the second time, in case you get the voicemail. Third time, in case you get the voicemail. And if you get somebody in during that time, perfect. I was reading a study today, and again, studies vary, right? So I'm just throwing this out there for your consideration. Uh, one study showed that the number of calls to connect with the person you're trying to talk to, that the magic number is six. Six is the number. And what's also interesting, when they looked at the time of days to call, uh, two things, what days to call and what time during, to call. So write this down. So first of all, uh, again, days to call, no, average number of calls is six. So keep that in mind. Take six calls just to connect with the person you're trying to talk to. And by the way, let's put the gatekeeper aside for now, right? By the way, I do have another program for how to get around the gatekeeper in the Sales Velocity Academy. But put that aside for now. The best dates to call are Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursday. So write that down, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursday. And in fact, I'll write it down. So the best days to call are Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Now, if they said they had to pick one day, it was probably gonna be this day right here, Wednesday. But all three days are good days. What was interesting is that in this one study, it said the best time to call is between 11 and noon, right? 12 noon, and then four to 5 p.m. Interesting times, right? Now think about this. You know, I was reading the article, the study, and I go, huh, why those times? And I started thinking about this, right? I go, why those times? But it kind of makes sense. If you think about your own way of doing things, right? Because somewhere around 11 o'clock, you start thinking about, all right, I need to ramp down and get ready, maybe start thinking about lunch where I'm gonna go. So maybe you're jumping out of meetings around that time, unless you have a, you know, a midday meeting. And then somewhere around four or five o'clock, four or five, you start ramping down, trying to close out the day. I know, some of you stay till six, I get that. But these are the numbers that were given and I wanted to share that with you. The average call to connect to the person you're trying to talk to is six and those are some good times to call. Again, it's, it's, again you can read different studies that'll tell you different things. I'm just sharing with you this personal study. 
All right, you guys got that, right? Number three, you got to know who you're talking to. That's your ideal client profile. And then you got to know what to say. Whether you talk to the person that your your ideal client profile or whether you're talking to a gatekeeper, okay? Gatekeeper, right? Because you got to learn how to talk to gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are not your enemies. They're your friend if you can make them your friend. Number four, price reluctance. Sometimes you're calling and the reason you're afraid to talk to clients is because you know you're more expensive. To which I say, lean into that. I want you to lean into that. Do you know what I mean by that when I say lean into that? By lean into that, accept the fact that you are more expensive. Yeah, of course I am. What's your point? I mean, that should be your attitude. Of course we're more expensive. That's because we're better. That's what we go. We do things differently. We do things better. So uh, I, w- I have a coaching client I was with today and we brought up the whole thing about pricing again. In his brain, he's thinking, well, they're always asking about price. And I, and I said, what do you say? Well, I try to rationalize and justify our price. I said, well, first of all, you should let them know somewhere early in the conversation that you're not the cheapest price on the block, that you're not the cheapest value because you are the best value. So Mr. Customer, if you're looking for price, I'm probably not what you want. If you're looking for quality, I'm the guy you want. That's, you know, that mindset. And you, I want you to have that mindset. Because again, when somebody says you're expensive, I used to always say, yes, I get that. And let me explain why. So I, I didn't you know, pull back from That's what I mean, lean into that. By lean into that, I mean, don't be afraid to let people know that you are more expensive. Of course I am. It's almost like, you know, of course I am. You know, <laughs> what's your point? I'm going to explain why I'm more expensive, and then you're going to understand why you should pay a little more. And I always tell clients, I said, I said, between you and I, you know, we've all done this. You've done this. I've done this. Have you paid more, a little bit more for something, not because it was the best of the best, but because you trusted the person, you felt comfortable with the person? Perfect example of why people buy you, the salesperson, over the product sometimes. Remember what I've said in the past live streams. All products are almost the same. All services are almost the same. The true differentiators in today's market is you, the salesperson, and how you frame the pricing conversation. Listen to what I just said, because that's important. How you frame the pricing conversation will determine how comfortable the client feels with that. If you're timid, if you're timid about presenting your price, the customer will feel that and probably ask you for a discount. But if you say, yeah, of course we're more expensive, let me walk you through why we're more expensive. Or yes, we're more expensive, let me show you what that buys you in the long run. That's what customers want to hear. And if you can present your case, which is what you need to do, then customers are willing to pay a little more. If customers are always going the price, if customers are always going the price, that means somewhere in your conversation, you added no value. Hate to say it, but you didn't add value. You just commoditized yourself, right? Next one, number five. I love this one. Product knowledge. Hmm, good one. Now, maybe the reason you have cold call reluctance is because you don't really know the product as well as you should. I may even add that you don't even know the market as well. Sometimes when we don't know the product, we don't know the market as well, we have that reluctance to call because we don't want to be put on the spot and, and, and being, at, being asked tough questions, right? So I always say two things. Rule number one when it comes to product knowledge, and this is an important one, and I learned this a while back. Be a product, be a product of the product. I love this phrase. This is a great phrase. That should be emboldened, you know, emblazoned on some rock or something, right? It should be, be a product of the product. What does that mean? Be a product of the product means use the product. You gotta use the product, man. You gotta use it. If you're not using it, first of all, how are you gonna know the benefits of it? Second, how can you sell with conviction when you don't even use the product? Now, I know what you're saying, Victor, but what if I can't buy the product? For example, let's say you live in a condo, right? and you sell pools. You're a salesperson and you sell pools. You probably say, well, Victor, I can't sell pools because I I can't own a pool because I live in a condo or an apartment. I can't own a pool. Option B. If you can't be a product of the product, then you do is you you talk to clients who use, you know, clients who use the product. Now, imagine you went to talk to customers who use the product. You don't know the product, but you go talk to the customer. Tell me why you like this product. How's the product working for you? Talk, walk me through what you find in terms of the benefits. So now when you're talking to another client, you can use that as a reference point, as a touchstone, right? So you can actually say, look, 
I've talked to many of my clients and here's what they tell me about using this pool. Here's what they love about it. Now you're selling with conviction, not because you're a product of the product, because you talk to clients who actually use the product. You grab that knowledge and you're passing it on to your new customers. This is powerful because if you're lacking confidence today in selling your product, that's why the cold call reluctance comes in, then maybe the best way to get that confidence is to be a product of the product but if you can't be a product of the product, then find clients who are using their products and ask them, why do you love this product? And let them tell you and let them inspire you to transfer that information on. Number six out of 10, in case you joined us late. All right, product value. Now let's push deeper. Product value is really trying to figure out a way to actually quantify the value of what you're selling. So when you're selling a product, remember the product has a price, but in, in the end, you're giving more value than the price you're receiving. Let me say that again. I'm selling a product at a price, but I'm also offering you more value than the actual price. That's real sales. If I can show you that the price, price of this product is a thousand bucks, but it's gonna save you 5,000 over the long run, then that's a great value. Can you quantify the value of what you're offering? You've seen me talk about this in past live streams or in one of my courses, I have something called value, and I wanna emphasize this because this is a really valuable course I have. Value-centric selling. Value-centric selling. This one is my biggest course. I think this one has, I'm guessing, but I think it has like 37 videos, this course. And this course is all about quantifying value. How do you show the customer? How do you calculate like return on investment, your break-even points, right? Your total cost of ownership. Now, this is more for B2B. But when you can quantify value, what they're gonna get, and you can do this with B2C as well, when you can quantify some of that value, then you're selling the product value. So if you know the value, you'll wanna call because look, when you know your product's value, it's like you're anxious to tell somebody because you know this is valuable information. So when you pick up the phone call to interrupt a stranger, rule number one of cold call reluctance, you feel good doing it because you're delivering value. I'm showing you something. So, uh, and by the way, I'm gonna answer all your questions when I finish all 10, okay? So I'm not, I'm not ignoring you. Well, I'm kinda am, but I wanna get through this first. Number seven, big one, big one, huge one. This one I want you to give me a one or a zero if this is you. Self-talk. You ever just talk yourself out of things? Well, now's not a good time to talk. You know, maybe I should call later. Well, let me do this first, and then you know what I'll do is I'll call up. Well, let me go get some food first, and then I'll come back after lunch, and I'll make some home calls. Uh, you know what, let me walk around the block a little bit, let me get my head straight, and then I'll start making calls. You start talking to yourself in such a way that you basically psych yourself out. Psychologists have a phrase for this. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And the way the fundamental attribution error works, fundamental attribution error works, it's not that it's self-talk, but it, it's a way you superimpose what you think is happening on the other end of the phone. For example, if this resonates with you, let me know. You ever talk to somebody on the phone, and here, oh, let's, let's give a real example. Has this ever happened to you? You call somebody. You say, hey, da-da-da-da-da, uh, it was great talking to you. Can you call me back? They'll say, yeah, I'll get back to you. And they'll say, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Right? Get back to you tomorrow. And then they get back. And then tomorrow rolls around. They don't call back. They don't call back. And you're like, oh, that's unusual. And then two or three go days go by, and they still don't call back. Right? You're like, now you're starting to get a little upset, right? A week goes by. And maybe you call them and he still ha won't return your phone call, right? Two weeks go by, no call. Three weeks go by and you're like, screw this. Screw that customer. I knew he didn't want to buy. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. He didn't want to buy. Have you been there? Hit me with the one if you know what I'm talking about. Hit me with the one if you know what I'm talking about. And then week four rolls around and you get a call from the customer and the call goes something like this. Victor. Sorry I couldn't get back to you. I apologize for not returning your phone call, but I had to fly to Europe. My mother passed away. I was there for the funeral for the last two and a half weeks with my family. It's been a very tough time for me. I'm ready to talk to you now. How do you feel? How do you feel? You feel like crap, don't you? Because see, in your mind, this is the fundamental attribution error. You thought the person was going dark on you. Do you know what I mean by going dark? When a client goes dark, they stop returning your phone calls because they don't want to talk to you. But it wasn't that they, they went dark, is that they had a reason, but your brain said, 
they're going dark. You see, maybe I said something wrong in that conversation. You know, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I did something wrong. I knew I shouldn't have. You know, I didn't kind of like that person anyway. And then all of a sudden your brain starts doing that whole self-talk thing. And again, what you're doing is you're superimposing what you think is happening on the other side of the phone. Have you ever talked to somebody and they're real short with you? Like, and they're like pushing you off the phone. You're like, mm, all right, I'll get off the phone. You ever do It's like, all right, I'll get off the phone. What's wrong with that person? I get off the phone, right? And then they call like two days later and said, look, I had just got into an argument with my family or whatever it may be, and that's why I was really short with you. I'm really sorry. See, but in your mind, you just thought they were being a jerk, but they were, there were other things going on. In other words, we start to, again, attribute something to a situation that really isn't there, that isn't true, and that's how you psych yourself out. Let me know if you know what I'm talking about. All right, number eight. Sometimes you're like, but my product isn't perfect. That's, you know, and it's, it sits there, right? But well, I don't know if we have the best product, Victor. I don't know if we have the best product. And I, I don't know if the best product. Our competitor's got a real good product. And then you're afraid to call because you don't have the perfect product. Now, tell me if you this has happened to you. Have you ever worked on a project? I'm talking any project. Pick a project that you've worked on. For example, painting. I like painting, I like walls. I like painting walls. It's a thing, right? And so the problem with painting is that when I paint, it comes out really good, right? People are like, oh, what a great paint job. I mean, it's like beautiful. I mean, my, my, the trimming, everything, I mean, I'm, it's good, right? The problem is everybody that walks in the room is like, that is, my, man, that is a great paint job, right? But the problem is because I painted it, I know where all the, as they say, my Puerto Rican friends will get this, where all the chivos are at, right? I know where all the little errors are at, where all the little imperfections are at. But the interesting thing is nobody else sees them, but you see them because you see all your blemishes. It's like when you look at your own face, right? It's funny how you look at your own face and you see all the things wrong with your face. Well, at least I do, right? But you're, you're, you know, I'm saying you notice every little freckle, every little blemish, and people look at you and they're like, My, they don't even notice it. True story, I gotta share, I gotta share this with you. I gotta share this, this is a true story. And this just happened this past week. Not lying to you. Not lying to you. Couldn't make this up. You can even go to my Facebook page to verify what I'm about to say. And so I have a cousin. It's a wonderful cousin who uh, is, uh, she's a vocalist. And her and her husband have been singing, you know, gospel music. You know, I can call it gospel. I guess, you know, Spanish, you know, religious music, right? Uh, Musica Cristiana, no? And they were here two years ago. True story, they were here two years ago in my studio, right here in the studio, right? And so you can't see it, but I got a green screen right there, a big, huge green wall. And their singing is so beautiful. And I knew that they had the guitar, the husband plays the guitar, my cousin sings, right? And so I, re I said, you know what, you know what would be great? That if you t picked a song, I said, pick a song, but before you play the song, tell me the story about how you developed the song and then play the song, right? And so we recorded, to make a long story short, we recorded this like this, we were against this wall, and we, I recorded four, like four of their, what they call their testimony, and then the song, right? So four of them. I edited the video, it's, I put beautiful clouds in the background, it's really because, you know, it's very spiritual, right? And for two years, I'm not joking, for two years, I've been trying to get my cousin to post these videos. I said, they're very powerful, they're very moving. And just go to the Victor, just look at Victor Antonio, my Facebook page, you'll see him there. And, and, she was, and, she was, and she just didn't do it. She kept coming up with excuses, right? So earlier this week, I was talking to her. I think it was like Sunday or Monday. I don't know what day was. And I said, when are you going to put up those four videos? Because I'm telling you, they're powerful videos. I said, you've never put those up. And she goes, well, I'm going to get it. And I could tell she was doing that whole, I don't want to do it. You know, that, I'll get around to it. So I said, screw it. I posted all four videos. That's why if you go to uh, if you go to my my Facebook page, my personal page is uh, facebook.com. So you don't mind, just go to facebook.com, facebook.com, and then type in sales influence, sales influence, and you'll see it. Now they're in Spanish, so be warned. So if you don't understand Spanish, but it's beautiful music, so you might just enjoy the music. And so what I did is I was like, I got off the phone with her. And I was like, she's never going to post them. I said, screw it, I'm going to post it for her right? And so I posted it for her, 
and right, I, one video has like a, almost 160 or 170 shares with almost 10,000 views. Just incredible numbers for that video, right? It's a short video within like, uh, I think 72 hours, it's gotten that many shares, a very popular video. And I, I, I talked to my cousin afterwards because I, you know, she noticed what I did and I said, I kind of pushed her out of the nest. And she said, you know, she said, cousin, primo, to be honest, I said, the reason I didn't, I didn't post those is because I, I just didn't think that it was, you know, you know, the, the recording was good, but it wasn't the way I wanted it. And I didn't look my best. And I thought, you know, that whole thing, she does that. And what she realized is that, see, she was waiting for perfection. You can't wait for perfection. I've always said, never aim for perfection, aim for success. Nothing's ever perfect. Your product is never perfect. Your product will never be the best. You probably say, well, maybe uh, Apple. Does Apple have a perfect product? No, because every time I'm getting an update on these iPhones, that means it's not perfect. So realize that it's not so much that you gotta have the best product. Because remember, at the end of the day, they want a great product, but they also want you as their salesperson. So don't be, don't see the blemishes in your product. It's too easy. I'm telling you right now, I, I guarantee you right now that if you were to go to your competitor who you think they have their act together, you're probably thinking, well, our competitors have their act together. They have a better product. I am guaranteeing you right now that if you go over there, they will tell you about the imperfections of their product because nobody has a perfect product. So get that out of your head because I think that's one of the reasons people don't call. I don't have the best product. You don't need the best product. You just need a great product. Imagine fear. This is almost like the fundamental attribution error. Is that the imagined fear is this, this, these things, you, these illusions you conjure up in your head of how the, the conversation might go. Maybe you'll say something wrong. I say, what if I say something wrong? What if I do this? And you go into the what if mode and all this is imagined fear. And a lot of that fear comes from, believe it or not, and if you were in my last couple of live streams, you know I'm really heavy on this now, is from memory. See, somewhere in the past you had a bad experience. And, that, and now you're in that situation again where you're about to talk to a stranger and that experience just rushes forward and it scares you. It scares you. That's the imagined fear. So keep that in mind. Last but not least, so I can wrap this thing up. If you're afraid to cold call, I say to you, I can wrap up the previous nine by saying this, you don't have a big enough why. I'm not trying to go Simon Sinek on you. I'm just saying you don't have a big enough why because if you have a big enough why, you will make the call. If your sense of urgency to succeed is there, you will call. If you're a startup business, you're an entrepreneur, you know what I'm talking about. Because when you got to make the number, you got people who are depending on you, you got to hit that number. That's your big why. My question to you is, have you really defined your big why? If you're, you're, you're a young couple starting up, right? Let's say your husband or you're the wife selling. Think about it this way. In today's business, in today's just today's number, for you to send your kid to college, let's say you have two, three kids. By the time they hit 18, which goes like that, blink of an eye, they'll get to 18. You want to send them to college. How much is that going to cost you? What do you think a college fund costs this day? Today, we're just talking today, not 18 years from now. Today, if you wanted to send your kid to a public school, a public college, you're looking at at least 100000 Yeah, 100000 and if you send them to a private school, you might as well double that or at least 2.5 that thing, which is like two, $250,000 if you want to send them to Yale, Harvard, Ivy League school. But this right here, for a great school, public school, that's the minimum. My question to you is, where are you going to get that money? But maybe that's where your why comes from. Maybe you want to put enough money. If you got three kids, now you got to multiply this by three, by the way. So maybe you need to understand, because if you don't do that, did you know, let's just kind of play this what if game. If you let your kids take out loans, right? I mean, they might get some grants, they might get some, you know, some whatever, some, some loans here. But at the end, most people, it takes 22 years. Look at this number. It takes 22 years after graduation to pay off your loans. Let me ask you a question. If you're a parent and a salesperson, do you want to saddle your kid with that much debt? graduating, having to pay for 22 years. That should be a sense of urgency. The question is, what is your big why? Like, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Are you trying to pay off your house? Are you trying to pay off some bills? Are you trying to catch up? Are you trying to get ahead? What is that why? Because when that thing, that why is front and center, all the fear melts away. All the previous nine melt away. When you have this big enough why, you're doing what you're doing, you will make the call. So if you're afraid of making the call, then you simply haven't defined a big enough why. There is no sense of urgency. You're too comfortable. Because people who want to succeed, they're like, I got to get there. 
I'm trying to retire by 35. I'm trying to retire by 45. Whatever it is, whatever your goal is, find a big enough why. And those are the 10 reasons why we have cold call reluctance. The last one, I think, being the biggest one. So anyway, I'll take some of your... Uh, let me see. You guys put a lot of comments here, man. So I'm about to go through a lot of this right now. Uh, Oh, this, I love this one already. This is funny. This is, uh, I, I assume, and Andy, I'm just picking you to start here. It's like a guy, guy selling Mercedes but drives a Toyota. That's called being a product of the product. See, if you're going to sell Mercedes, you better be driving a Mercedes. That's a, ex exactly the example. Thank you very much. Great example. Uh, let me see here. Uh, some of you jumped in late. That's okay. Herb wash. Talking to client, product owners always gives you most of the blocks you'll receive. They'll give you the pros and cons. Boom. That's important. Because you talk to enough clients, even when they say no. What if at the end of the no, you say, Mr. Customer, can I ask you, I'm not trying to sell you anymore. Can you tell me why this is not a fit for you? I'm not trying to sell you. And whatever content they give you is what you're going to use to go to the next sale and close that deal. Because every time you just get better. So let me get, go through some of these comments now. The more you know your business, the better you'll be able at beating your competitor and give your customer excellent service. Always know your business. Boom, Mario. Well said, man. Yes, I have talked myself out of a sale. You're honest, Nancy. And by the way, back in the day, so did I. And probably everybody on this chat and on this conversation is done. So you're not alone. So welcome to the club. We just got to get past that. Uh, RS Lifestyle. Dude, I love you, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Doug Man Fresh 23. Love it. Calling back one. Okay, this is what I was asking about. I forgot what I was asking. But anyway, I'm glad you thought that was funny. Uh... You guys have been there, right? You started imagining things, right? Uh, six, hate it. Okay. This one, Rod Vidre. Love this, Victor. What's the hard question to ascertain customer's interest if after two or three follow-ups, he or she gives you a vague answer with uh, proper without proper commitment? So this is one, Rod. I love this one because it's one of those things where a customer says, can you get back to us next quarter? Now, I'm going to give you one variation and you can just, you know, you can just play with this. But when people push me off, what I think is a push-off, right? Like, yeah, call me back. Call me next quarter. We don't have a budget. When we'll have a budget, that's when we would do it. You know, that whole thing, right? And so I always figure out a way to see if that's a real objection or not, right? If that's a red herring or not. And that, that's a good question. So if I'm calling up somebody and I've, let's say, look, after three follow-ups, you got to pick your number, Rod. I'm not giving you a number. But after three follow-ups, I'm done. I'm moving on. And then maybe I, maybe I won't like nix the contact, but maybe I'll move them six months out and try again in six months. But when somebody says, hey, Victor, can you call me next month? Uh, it's when we're going to reset the budget, right? And I'll say something like this, Rod, are you, I said, just to be clear, Rod, so when somebody tells me to call me next month, because that's when they'll have the budget, it's usually because they're really not interested and they just pretty much don't want to tell me that, or you're really interested and you'll think you'll have the budget next month. Which one is it? I always do that. I always do that. Which one is it? It's almost when I, people say, I'll think about it. When people tell me they have to think about it, it's usually because they're not interested or they're interested but not sure which one is it. So use that option thing, Rod. That might help a little bit. Uh, Boricua, I'm glad you found that funny. This is gold. I needed to hear that from Johan Bonilla. Love it, man. Uh, Brian, welcome, man. Another version of analysis paralysis. That's exactly what it is, man. Uh, damn, I missed this. No, you didn't. You caught some of it at least. Uh, my whole business cold calling people who don't want me calling. <laughs> That's what it is. If cold calling was easy, why would they need you, right? Uh, yep, it's so true. It's a, it's just push you hard when you have a big why. Yeah, you got to have that big why. And Brian, we all know, right? Uh, fear is false evidence appearing real. It's all an illusion. Uh, thanks for the knowledge. Thank you for joining me. Uh, then can you sell a Lambo without driving one? I don't know. I personally think if you're selling Lambos, you better, <laughs> I would try to get a Lambo. I got to be honest, if I'm selling something like that, I got to get a Lambo. I don't care if it's a five-year-old Lambo, I'm getting me a Lambo. I never said it had to be a new Lambo, right? So I can give me an old Lambo. But if you know that that's going to be your business, let me ask, let me put it this way, Rod. If you're dabbling, you kind of like, you know how you just put your toe in the water just to see if you want to do it, then you're not going to succeed. But let's say you're all in on being the number one salesperson in that Lambo dealer. Let's say that you're, you're, you're committed. I'm going to be number one. My question to you is, would you invest in yourself? And that investment includes learning, obviously, but maybe the Lambo. Would you do it? Knowing that if all you had to do was sell 10 Lambos and you pretty much have this, I'm not saying all paid off, but let's just say it, 
it's pretty much a done deal. Would you do it? I think you would. So that's what I'm saying, but you have to be a product of the product because, and by the way, I am not saying, because somebody's gonna say, are you saying it's not possible to sell a Lambo if you drive a Toyota? I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it's impossible at all, right? I am saying that it's hard to develop credibility and talk to a customer at their level when you don't know the product. Now, there's gonna be customers who walk in who are gonna buy anyway. You'll sell those, but those that are on the fence, again, those will be the tough ones to sell, but it's a great question you have. Great question. School is long-term debt, a chain on your ankle. It could be. So on that one, Mario, I graduated with some debt, right? But I got an engineering degree and an MBA, and it's been the, big, it's been the greatest return on investment. So I always tell people, say, the degree depends, just like the Lambo conversation, the degree, the degree depends, uh, or getting a degree depends on which one you get. If you get a good degree where people pay money for it, then you're in the, you know, you're in the pocket. So I always say, it depends. Guilty Nancy, you're not alone. There you go. Procrastination by sale. Yep. Uh, let me see. Back, Mario. That's if the job hires you and the salary you believe you'll get, that could be 40 years of debt. Yeah, man. I get you, man. I get you. Victor, how to create a compelling proposition in a cold call. I am a financial planning operating in a B2C model. The question is, what does your customer want to hear? Remember, in a B2C model, it's either up here, right, psychological, emotional, or financial. In your case, you're going to try to impact all three. The question is, how do you develop a story? So if I'm talking to a couple, I, and I know they have kids, that's going to be one storyline, right? If I'm talking to a, one, a, a single person who's, I guess, looking to take care of their grandparents, whatever it may be, then I'm talking about another story. So each one depends on how you build your own story. So really find ways to show them the value of investing. I know it's a very vague answer. I admit that because it's, it really depends on how you script it for what person. So uh, I think I mentioned I'm working, one of my, one of my coaching clients is a, uh, he sells disability insurance. And so I'm working with him on developing scripts for talking to single people, also couples, and then people who've been in, let's say, law firms for a very long time, people who are not equity partners, but close to being you know, equity partners. And so there's three different scripts that we develop because there's three different conversations that you're gonna have. That's why it's hard to answer that one right away. How do we establish the why? Number 10, it's all you, Noelia. I can't help you that. You have to figure out what the big why is. Like, what, what, what is it that you want? Do you know what I mean? What is it that you want, Noelia? Something you found. What do you want? You know, what, what is something that, and I, I would usually start with the fear. You know, it's funny because I, you know, I, I always tell people, like, what's their greatest motiv motivator? I'm like, fear. Like, I am so fear driven, it isn't funny. And so maybe you can start there. Like, what are you afraid of? like not having enough money. So you got a picture here, and I'm assuming that's you and your mother, right? And so right now, maybe your mother's gonna, maybe she doesn't need anything, but maybe in the long run, she's gonna need money, right? For something, whatever it may be. And so do you have enough money? You know, put away. You know, uh, I, I, I interviewed, um, do you guys know Susie Orman? Susie Orman, the financial guru? I interviewed her, I think I'll post the interview maybe this week. So I interviewed her about two weeks ago. Finally got the uh, the interview video yesterday, two days ago, whatever it is. And she says, on average, you should have nine months of resource. Nine, if you lost your job, you should have nine months of funding in savings, right? Nine months of funding in savings to really kind of before you can get your next job. I think in this market, it's probably more like a year. But if you don't have nine times, nine months worth of finances in your bank account, that would be a big enough why for me. Like, I need to build this money up so I'm not in a situation. You probably know somebody right now who's probably hurting financially. We all know somebody like that, right? So your big why could be, you know, I want enough money where I don't have to worry if I lost my job tomorrow, how would I take care of myself, my family, or my mother? Something like that. So that's where you would begin. Procrastination by sales PR. Don't know what that means, Maud, but hey, by the way, welcome back, Eminem. Always great to have you back. If you can elaborate on that, love to answer that one. I only debate and philosophize back and forth on is A, is it better to do a two-step call process, intro qualify, then pitch on the second call, or B, just straight cold pitch, which is pretty brutal. Yeah, I think you have to measure that yourself. I mean, it's one of those things where you have to kind of do your own empirical testing, your, your split testing of A, B, which one's better. The... You know, because a lot of it's going to depend also, right? Decouts five, seven. 
uh, it's going to depend on the person you get on the other. Because sometimes you get a client and then you can just tell they're very receptive to the call. They're, they're the perfect qualified call and they've picked up the phone and you can just tell that this is a person you could have a conversation with. Sometimes you don't want to be too rude and you want to set up a meeting and then do the actual sales pitch. So uh, you can do them both ways. I think your two-step process, I've been seeing it from all the clients I've worked in, is setting up the second meeting, doing the short pitch, which is set up the value on the first call, and then that, that short value is really selling them on a meeting. And that seems to be very successful. Uh, I'm seeing interesting numbers, uh, if I can share. So it, with one of my clients, uh, they're doing about, again, about 100 calls, right? And they're trying to get this done in a day, right? Let me put this down here. And what they're seeing is from here, about maybe 40%, 40 people have agreed to the meeting. Uh, and they have like, a, I think it's like a 50%, you know, actual meeting rate of only 20 people actually showing up. So I don't know. Those are interesting numbers, right? And so look at it from your perspective. And But once they get here, the close rate is pretty high. If they get the one-on-one, -on -one, the close rate is pretty high. So... Something to keep in mind. So it's a great question, though. It's a great philosophy. Hold on. Can you give me some examples of the first 10 seconds of a cold call? So the first 10 seconds of a cold call is, first of all, do not do the long story pitch, Kia. Like the long story pitch is who you are. They don't care. They just want to know how you can help them. My name is Victor Antonio. I'm a sales trainer working with companies in your industry where we help people, your salespeople, increase their sales by 43% within a given six-month time period. Is that something you'd be interested in? Or are you the right person to talk to? Or something like that, right? And you can just define that. But the value's gotta be that quick. It's like five to seven seconds almost immediately. 10 seconds, give yourself a break here. And that's how the value has to be in. But you have to be able to prove that value. Something. And again, uh, one of the, uh, I got a cold calling course and then the prospecting course actually goes into the value messaging because each one is different. Uh, I saw you, uh, writing your video on Instagram. That was for a company. We did a um, Shrutesh. Uh, I did a virtual seminar for a, a company, and that was one of the things. The actual bike is right here, and there's the green screen right there. And so, anyway, it was a promo video. It was a fun video. By the way, virtual conference, 19,000 people. 19,000. One nine. 19,000. Uh, procrastination by sales professionals is a challenge. Isn't that interesting, Eminem? The, the procrastination by sales professionals is a challenge, but the question is, why are they procrastinating, right? And I'm telling you, what we discussed today is why they're procrastinating. That's like, they're like brake pads holding, or, or brakes just holding back. That's why they're procrastinating. They're scared of something. They don't know their product. They don't know what to say. They don't know who to talk to. They have this imagined fear of what might happen. They don't want to interrupt people. They feel awkward. This is why procrastination happens, but good point. Excellent point. Uh, VDK, Krish. Just want to say that. By the way, nice logo. Look at that. Sunset or the sunrise? I don't know. I think it's a sunset. Uh, my experience, people are wasting their time by follow up, following up with the wrong clients. We should filter the right clients as early as possible. Amen. Amen. In other words, qualify hard at the beginning. I had a lady years ago. I, I just cracked up a VDK because she said, she, she asked me the question. I said, Victor, I followed up with a client nine times and they won't, you know, I can't close them. What should I do? What would you say? Here's what I said. I said, well, here's what you, all you need to do is find another client. Stop calling. Now, what's interesting about that VDK is that the reason she was calling as I talked to her, and I, and I kind of exposed her in a good way. I said, the reason you're calling that client is because you don't have any other clients in your pipeline. Because if you had 20 other people waiting to talk to you, you would be immediately pushing this person out of your pipeline. So I said, you don't have, again, you don't have a, a, you know, a sales problem. You have a prospecting problem. Because if you had a lot of people coming in, you wouldn't spend that much time. And you, would, as you say, VDK, you would qualify harder. You would ask the tough questions. You would ask the money questions. I mentioned this uh, years ago. We went to do our bathroom. And within five minutes, the lady said to me, we don't handle projects that are below $5,000. Is that okay? Now, immediately I was offended because I was like, yeah, I can afford $5,000. But I realized what she was doing is that she was qualifying me. She was priming me, letting me know what the minimum was, which is brilliant, but she was qualifying me right off the bat. And I love that. So the, the, the sooner you can qualify them, better. You know, fear of success is another doorstopper for call reluctance. 
you know, you know, fear of success is a weird one, right, Andy? I know what you're kind of alluding to it. I, that this one's always puzzled me. Is that some people like they they stop themselves from being successful for whatever weird reason is? I, you know, it's one of those things that you know that's a weird one. Do you know what I mean? If you want to add some flavor to that, go ahead. But I, you know, when people say maybe I'm, I'm afraid of succeeding, and I often think about are they really afraid of succeeding? Are they really? Because if they do succeed, what's the worst that can happen, right? But but I, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. So good point, good brain stopper for me. So that's a good one, man. Are you still using the spin method? It's amazing. Remember, R&J Recording Studio Mendoza. Uh, the, the spin selling, we talked about this in, uh, I think, the last live stream, maybe two live streams ago. Remember, uh, the spin selling situation, problem, implication, need, right? What's the situation? Identify the problem. What are the implications of not solving that problem? And what's the need payoff? You know, what, if, they did, if they did fix the problem, what, how would they benefit? Now. The way this was developed is that you go in there asking a lot of questions about situation and problem. The only difference, yes, the answer is yes, by the way. I do still use it. But the only is, uh, difference is I actually do the research on the situation and the problem. So when I get there, I kind of already know what the situation problem is. And then I highlight what the implication is because sometimes they don't even know how much money they're losing. Right? So, yes, the answer is absolutely. Ah. Uh, I work in a wedding venue, an expensive one in the area. I know my product very well, but I feel that I don't have much connection with the brides. Any recommendations? That's because you don't get access, right, Evelyn? That's probably because it's hard to get access to the brides, right? And so, you know, uh, my daughter's getting married, right? And so we went through that whole process. And, you know, you go to the venue, and really it's the venue people that recommend you know, and lay out that format. Is that right, Evan? I mean, that's how, that's what I experienced. So if I'm, if I'm selling, if I need to talk to the bride, which you don't have access to, what I would do is find a way to position myself with the venue as their number one option. Do you know what I mean? So whatever product or service you offer, if I'm working with a wedding venue, what I want to do is position myself with them so I'm always their favorite. So that's the question you should be asking. I said, how do I become the wedding venue's number one person? What can I do? And it's all about little things you do. Follow up, send them business, right? Uh, uh, I was talking to a gentleman, we were talking about uh, a coaching client, and we were talking about how do you get distributors to sell your product versus another person's or another company's. And one thing we came to conclusion, because I've done this in the past, is we would do joint advertising or marketing. Right, we would do joint advertising, and that just kind of tied us together. So I would look for ways to, to really get close to the venue. You're not going to get access to the bride. Remember, the bride is a one and done. Right? Hopefully, they won't get married again. But one and done is that you're not going to see them again ever. But the venue people, those are the people you have to build a relationship with. I would start there. Uh, let me see. What did I say? Uh, Herbosh, best live video since I've been watching. So much content on point. I'll share the heck out of this, Victor. Thank you, man. Herb, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Love when you're on here, man. Uh, Rod, appreciate it. Do you believe cold calling is a numbers game? A thousand calls to achieve, say, 10 sales on average rather than spend more time on quality lead gen and have 100 to close five. The answer is you're, you're right in both cases. Here's the thing, Rod. So let's break down this example. By the way, I would rather spend more time with quality leads than just calling, you know, dialing for dollars, right? And so, so but let me just step back. And because every time I hear this numbers game, I feel like I just need to clarify because it's it. I don't want to say it's a bad statement, but I just, I would qualify it. And so maybe if I can show you something from this point on, you'll, whoever's using the numbers game line, maybe you'll think about it because it really kind of isn't a numbers game sometimes. For example, let's say that I'm selling a product, right? I'm selling a product. And this product that I'm selling, right? Let's say that if I if if I sell the product, it's a thousand dollar product. It's a thousand dollar product. Then and I get I don't know. I'm gonna just exaggerate and just say a uh, hundred dollar commission. You know, I mean I don't know if I want to make a lot of calls here, right? I don't think cold calling is worth it because that's a lot of calls. If I got to make a hundred calls just to get a hundred dollars, if I got to make a hundred calls to get a hundred dollars, I'm not gonna do it. I'm exaggerating for effect, right? That's, let's call that a B2C product, a low commission product. But now, let's say that I sell a different product, product B, this is product B, and this product 
is a $100,000 product, and if I just sell one, I get $10,000, okay? Now, if I'm in this scenario, it's not about volume calling, it's about finding the right buyer, right? So this is to your point, that in this case, I would try to qualify very carefully who I'm gonna call. I'm not just gonna call anybody, I'm gonna find out who specifically would buy this product. So in this case, it's not a numbers game, it's a qualifying game. In this case, it's a numbers game, and you gotta call a lot of people to make $100 and then drive that business. I don't know if that helped, but that's the way I look at it. So I'm always like trying to qualify, well, well, how much am I making? So, you know, anyway. So being pretty straightforward in sales is good enough. No, being pretty straightforward in sales is enough. Not good enough, it is enough, because that's what you people want. How to increase inbound calls? Marketing, 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 marketing. Rajiv, that's another subject, man. That's, that's, too, that's too big right now, but that's a good one because uh, I live on inbound calls a lot also because I do a lot of marketing. I do a lot of videos. This right here, what I'm doing right now, generates a lot of inbound calls, right? And so, you know, keep in mind that everything you do, everything you post online, uh, articles, blogs, videos, graphics, whatever, all that stuff generates. Whether you want to do pay-per-click, you know, advertisement with Google, uh, if you do search engine optimization, another way, all these things are cumulative value in terms of generating marketing or inbound calls. Any advice on being a successful executive search consultant when you represent, sell people and candidates and over, uh, market overall uh, to, overview to clients? Most of that interested at this time due to COVID. <clears throat> Great question, by the way. Uh, I was actually having this conversation, uh, Kanishka, Majumda, Kanishka. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine because uh, I was explaining that, you know, in the executive search business, I've worked with people, I know people that focus in hard on a market niche. You know what I mean? They don't just search for everybody. Even within, let's say, I'm just going to use technology as a general space. Even within technology, they grow into the micro niches, right? They really get niche hard. And because they niche so hard, they know that market so well that all of a sudden, that's what they're good at. And because they're good at it, the people they place within that market have a high success rate. Because remember, as an executive search person, right, your job is not to find people. That's part of the job. The thing is, remember, you also, I think, get paid on whether they stay or not. Retention. So gaining an employee, right, getting somebody, hiring somebody is one part. Getting them to stay is another thing. So if I were you, first of all, I'd focus in on the market that's Two, I would try to track what my retention rate is. In other words, when I put somebody in a company, they stay on average three years. That's what companies want to hear. That's real value. I can find you bodies. Anybody can find bodies. But to find a great body that stays within a company, and then not only do you emphasize retention, you also emphasize promotability. In other words, when you place people in a company, not only do they stay three years, they're also promoted to senior level da, 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 within two years. That's what they want to hear because that means they're adding value and they're staying with the companies, which is what they want. So hopefully that helps. All right, how to tap acquaintances who are perfect prospects but really value their privacy and dislike cold approaches. Um, it's the gig. Did you mean to say it's the game with that game? Uh, how to tap slowly. I think the, you know, when I, when I talk about the course, the predictable prospecting course I have, I think this is what I'm talking about is that, you know, there's certain clients who don't like to be cold call, you know, and I think you have to warm them up, right? It's almost like foreplay type of thing. And that is that you have to figure out your way, your method. You have to create a process for connecting with people gently, slowly, and over time. And I think it's a methodology that you just have to kind of create. It's a process. Too often... I, you know, how many of you get like, I'm on LinkedIn, I can't tell you how many emails I get every day, people who connect with me and then immediately pitch me on something. It just turns me off because that's almost like cold call, it's a cold email, right? And so I would say to you is you got to do it slowly. You got to figure out a system for connecting with people slowly. So again, look at the predictable prospecting system I have at the Sales Velocity Academy and I think that'll help you, man. Because that's again, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, I love a one call close, but sometimes it's not realistic. Yeah, so do I. I love one call close, but it's not realistic. Uh, Victor Tad, back in the house. Just do it. And rejection is the norm. Before I make a cold call every time, 
If I do it continuous for a month, it'll become part of my life. It becomes a habit. It's amazing that when you're just doing them, the cold calls, and you know what to say, you know what to respond, you know what you need to do as far as positioning the value. Once the scripts become very natural in your head, they start sounding natural, you're able to deal with the customer naturally. And again, it's just a matter of practicing. But again, never practice on the customer, so keep that in mind. Victor Tan comes back. Another good way is, is what I learned from you. Share and help the customers. I, I'll feel better, full of great content on your Sales Velocity Academy. There, join the Sales Velocity Academy. I'm telling you, the content is just fantastic in there. And I, again, I emphasize always, join the Sales Velocity Academy, it's $30. And then when you've had all the information you need, when you've gotten everything you need, just cancel your subscription. I don't get offended by that. I really like when people get on there and get off. So, you know, use some of the content. On this point, on the share and help, if you genuinely come from a space of wanting to help your clients, they will feel that. I think that's fantastic, Victor. Thank you, man. Uh, uh, Victor, want to role play? Not right now, but you pick a topic and we'll do it next time. Uh, I'll cold call you and you can, you can call me. <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, thanks again for the live feed. New to your channel, I'll definitely check future videos. Like I said, the only thing I ask for you guys is to share this with at least one or two people, uh, at least one person, and just let them know that this exists. I think it's good content, but you know what makes it even better content? These questions. So I do appreciate these questions. And, and again, uh, if I can't answer all your questions and I don't get to them, don't get mad at me. I do my best. But... You know, I do read the feeds later on, and so they give me ideas for the next live stream. So this one, this cold calling one came because many people just kept asking me about cold calling. Brian, great insight. Always get agreement to the next step. Even if it's not the final close, save time and tons of aggravation. So what Brian is saying, just to reiterate what he's saying, is that when you're talking to a client, again, you got to make sure that, that you're, you're, you're advancing the sale, you're taking it to the next step. If they say, let me think about it, that's not moving it anywhere. We'll get back to you, that's not advancing the sale. You have to get the next step commitment or not, you're just gonna wind up doing follow-up calls that go nowhere, the client goes dark. So again, advancing the sale is always important. Uh, hey, the grand fire expert back, all right. Hey Victor, I'm curious, is seduction techniques applicable to sales? You know, years ago, I read a book on, 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 on seduction techniques, and I, I think they're actually pretty good. I think there, there's something, there's certain, you know, things in there that are actually backed by science. You know what I mean? They're certainly backed by science. So, yeah, there's some techniques in there. Uh, one of my favorite ones is that, uh, you know, when you tell somebody, you know, I like you. I genuinely like you. I mean, really mean it. That there's this, this reciprocity thing that kicks in at a psychological level, right? It's like when you have you find common points to share. Immediately, there's that connection point. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, who was the guy that wrote uh, the, law, the uh, 50 Powers of Law? The Laws of 50 Powers? God, what's his name? I forgot his name. You know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, the Power of Laws is 50, right? And he wrote a book on seduction, which was very good as well. So check that out. If you guys know who I'm talking about, you know, hit me with that. I agree, excellent insight. Uh, good to see you. I'm glad you guys are starting to know each other. I know I'm interrupting you, and the reason for my call is, by the way, that right there is a simple one. I know I'm interrupting you, and the reason for my call is, you know, so that's short. Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be, I think we overcomplicate it too, too much. Do you believe the 50 days a row nonstop approach? God bless Wall Street 1987 and Charlie Sheen soliciting. Gatekeeper to get to your Gordon Gecko works these days or is there a better approach so it's like when he's trying to get the whale right he always had the whale call right there's one client he always wanted to get and so it was a non-stop approach i don't know man i haven't seen anybody really try that so why don't you try one pick one pick a whale you know a whale's ideal client pick a, a big client and why don't you try it man that's that's the only way to find out right i think it's uh i think if you do it in a nice way you know what i mean in a very cordial way i think that's how you do it man jim this is my script mr prospect I am, for my call is to help community banks increase market share uh, and wallet share is now a good time to talk. See, no. So I wouldn't do that because right there is what everybody else is saying. What they want to know is I work with community banks within your area. We've helped the last, you know, if you have a reference, the last bank we work with in your area, we helped them increase this by this percentage. That's quantifiable. That's nice, but everybody says that. But as soon as you start talking numbers, Remember, that might, you got to be sure that's the right person to talk to. I, I always use the line, are you the right person to talk to? You know what I mean? 
Use that one and then try the one, is this the person to talk to? And just test them. Like I said, by the way, I don't have the answer. Not everybody, anybody has the answer. You just have to find the script that works for you. So I like the way that, I like the fact that you're starting on the script. So way to go, man. I've just gone through your qualifying sales this morning. The basic before cold calling is to the market, the right segment prospect, market fit, and the ideal client profile first. Once you know who you're targeting, it becomes easier. Once you know what your market is, it becomes easier. And I think when we try to spray the whole market, that's where we get confused and we get a little nervous. Thank you, Victor. Uh, let me see. I love your series. The client says, this is a good one. So uh, this is a series in the Sales Velocity uh, Academy where I talk about, now right there, where I talk about the client says, and I give you the actual responses. And I got scripts for you. Thank you for bringing that up, Shuta. I totally forgot about that one. All right. I agree with Herb. Yes. Sharing already. Wonderful. Uh, what are good open-ended questions for inbound sales for cable and mobile? Uh, well, the in, in, what are good inbound sales? You want to ask them why they're calling you. You know what I mean? In an inbound sale, so somebody's calling. I, I assume, Nancy, you're doing some type of advertisement and they're calling and they want some questions. The first question I would ask you if we were talking one-on-one -on -one is I said, what does your advertisement say? Because we, we often don't think about this. When we put up an ad, people see that ad and that ad primes the brain. So when they make the call, there's certain expectations already that they've established in their head about what they want. So when some, I usually use the phrase, how did you find us? I saw your ad. Now, whatever that ad is, I know that they've been triggered by that ad. Get the idea? Now, if the ad is about improving your bandwidth, let's just say that, improving bandwidth, right? How to improve your bandwidth. And said, what was it about the ad that prompted you to call? He said, and they'll say, well, you know, I work for data, I work from home, and bandwidth is an issue. Well, tell me about it. You know, how much, tell me about your job. That's, you, you want open-ended questions. Well, tell me about what you do, and then I'll tell you what package I think would fit. I'm giving you a short version. And I'll go, well, this is what I do, and then I would ask questions, right? Now I go for the close-ended question. Well, how many calls a week do you do? How much uploading are you doing physically, da da da, da to the cloud? so forth and so on, because at this point they may need some business ethernet, right? Some higher speed, 2.5 gig type of things, right? So that's how I begin the conversation. Hopefully that helped a little bit, right? All right, so Brian, you guys are having a conversation, great. Uh, I cold called, and Deep Count says, I cold called to get 100 contacts and hope on average five leads come out, and if I'm lucky I pitch all 20 I get, one account, I think the hardest part is getting people on the phone. I agree, I agree. Uh, but again, and, and it really depends on the industry, but if you're calling that many people and you're only getting, you know, you, your close rate seems to be pretty, I'm lucky to pitch 20, so you're getting one out of 20, right? So that seems like a low close rate. So I would look at what's going on there if I were you, D Couch. There's something going on in that close rate. All right, folks, uh, you guys are still going down, man. I'm always getting shut down by the receptionist. Again, I got a program called uh, Getting Past the Gatekeeper. Uh, we've been out here now an hour, 12 minutes. I, was, I told my wife I'd do this in an hour. You guys are keeping me here a longer time. Thank you for joining me again. And again, do me a favor. I'm going to be on again. Let me see. Today is what? Thursday. I'll be on again Sunday night. Leave some comments. Hit the like button if you like this stuff. Uh, leave some comments on some subjects you want me to cover. You guys are talking about getting past the gatekeeper seems to be the one winning tonight. But leave some comments. I'll read them, and then that'll prime me for the next one. On that note, thank you guys. I love the fact that you guys show up and want to hang out with me. I appreciate it. And on that note, remember, selling ain't hard when you know how. Take care.